Good morning. My name is Doron Scher. As most of you will know, I am an orthopedic surgeon and my particular interests are in knee and shoulder surgery. I consult from the Randwick and Concord offices of Orthosports and I have a public appointment at Concord Hospital. Anterior shoulder instability is the most common form of shoulder instability and it is usually because of a traumatic injury such as a collision or fall on an outstretched arm with the shoulder abducted and externally rotated. The design of a round ball on a flat socket gives the shoulder maximum mobility, but stability then relies on a complex interplay between bony and soft tissue stabilizers. There is a spectrum from laxity to instability, and some people can be lax or loose without symptoms of instability. Others can have subtle instability, but quite severe symptoms. You can also get atraumatic instability with repetitive microtrauma, like is the case with overhead shoulder athletes and overhead laborers. Looking at the overall incidence of shoulder dislocation, it's in the order of 20 per 100,000 person years and is almost three times more frequent in men. This 23 goes to about 98 per 100,000 in the 20 year male age group, so it's five times higher. On the screen, we see an Australian javelin thrower who dislocated her shoulder during the competition. This was a non-contact injury, which is the more common mechanism in females. With non-surgical treatment, the likelihood of the shoulder dislocating again has been reported to be as high as 75%, with about one in five needing a repeated closed reduction. Athletes involved in contact sports have a significantly higher risk of recurrence after bank heart repair. So the main focus of today's talk is around decision making about which operation is the best to cure the person's instability. From its name, we know that the glenohumeral joint is made up of the round humeral head and the flat glenoid. The humeral head is large compared with a shallow glenoid fossa, and the inherent stability of the glenohumeral joint relies heavily on glenoid version and soft tissue stabilizers. The native glenoid is somewhat retroverted and the risk of anterior instability increases with greater antiversion. The soft tissue stabilizers of the glenohumeral joint can be divided into static and dynamic stabilizers. The static stabilizers have the greatest contribution to shoulder stability at the end of range of motion. These are principally the ligaments, but negative intraarticular pressure certainly contributes. The principal dynamic stabilizers are the muscles of the rotator cuff. The shoulder looks a lot like a golf ball on a golf tee. You will appreciate that for the ball to stay on the socket, the wider the socket is, the less likely it is that the ball will fall off. It follows therefore that an injury to the labrum or the bone that results in a reduced glenoid width, such as a bony bank heart injury, or something that reduces humeral head diameter, like a heel sacs injury, will lead to instability. Even when bone is preserved, it's possible for the shoulder to sublux or dislocate. This is because something has caused the muscles to no longer be able to center the joint and the capsule is loose. Muscle imbalance causes the shoulder to be compressed and shift from the center position, allowing it to sublux. If you don't control your scapula, this makes things worse. There are also static factors that can cause this, with a tilt of the glenoid being one of the most common. This allows the shoulder to sublux, as we see in this diagram. Now, most commonly, this will be posterior, and you have decentering of the humeral head away from the center of the glenoid. Unfortunately, this will lead to contact loading at the back of the glenoid and does lead to arthritis as the person gets older. Now the glenoid labrum itself is made up of dense fibrous tissue with very few elastic fibers. It deepens the glenoid and allows attachment of the glenohumeral ligaments to the glenoid. The labrum contributes enormously to glenohumeral stability and functions as a bumper. It seals the interface between the glenoid and the humeral head and it creates negative intraarticular pressure, that suction effect, which is why your shoulders don't dislocate when you die. Tearing of the labrum from the glenoid is commonly known as a Bankart lesion. A Bankart lesion causes a notable decrease in labral height and results in a pronounced reduction of glenohumeral stability. So who was Bankart? Well, I'll come back to that. There are other types of tissue damage in the shoulder. 
Leaving aside bone injuries for the moment, the other soft tissue injury that is often missed is a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, or haggle. These typically occur after a hyperabduction and external rotation injury of the arm, resulting in incompetence of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. A haggle has been observed in up to 9% of traumatic anterior shoulder dislocations and is more prevalent in young female athletes and seems to be associated with traction rather than collision. Let's now take a look at the structures nearby the shoulder that can get damaged either by the dislocation or with surgery. The axillary nerve is the principal nerve at risk. It can be stretched and create numbness in the lateral part of the upper arm, sometimes known as the sergeant badge sign. Occasionally, the entire brachial plexus can be injured, and very rarely this injury can be permanent. Generally speaking, arthroscopic surgery stays a long way from the vessels and nerves, but during a latter procedure, the musculocutaneous nerve in particular is at risk of permanent injury. Arthur Sidney Blundell Bankhart was an English surgeon who lived from 1879 to 1951, and he actually died in the evening after finishing a full day operating list. Interestingly, tearing of the labrum from the glenoid was very well described before him in 1890 by Brocker and Hartman, but their work was largely ignored. In 1906, Perthes originally described operative repair of the labrum, but it was Bankhart who popularized the operation for recurrent shoulder dislocation. At his time, most of the operations focused only on the capsule, not the labrum, or doing operations with dynamic slings, like taking a strip of the deltoid and passing it inferior to the capsule. One of Bankhart's quotes in 1939 was, the only rational treatment is to reattach the glenoid ligament to the bone from which it has been torn. And that remains true even today. So for most shoulder dislocations, the history is fairly straightforward. Many first-time dislocations end up in the emergency department for reduction. If someone is subluxing or self-reduces after a dislocation, the history may not be as clear. It's important to remember that shoulder instability rarely presents as a painful shoulder. They might have pain or apprehension with throwing or stingers going down the arm, but generally not pain in the shoulder itself once the acute injury has passed. Now, there are specific tests for shoulder instability, and the sulcus sign certainly is one of them, and the apprehension and relocation tests are probably the most useful. A careful examination under anesthetic will confirm the direction of instability, and this needs to be done every time before starting the actual operation. So what are the results like if we choose not to operate on someone with a dislocated shoulder? There was a study by Tsai and Johnson in 1991 where patients had an average age of 23. They were about seven years post their initial dislocation, and you can see what the levels of patient dissatisfaction were. There was another study by, by Hovelius who looked at natural history of shoulder injury over 20 years. And from his study, we know that you are much more likely to end up with arthritis in your shoulder if you have had two or more dislocations. Marks in 2002 showed that the risk of developing severe arthrosis of the shoulder is between 10 and 20 times greater for individuals who have had shoulder dislocations. Recurrent threat also changes with age. In the 16 to 20 year age group, the recurrence rate is virtually 100%, but this drops down to 70 to 80% once you get to about 25 years of age. So if you decide to operate as a surgeon, you now need to match your operation to the individual patient. And essentially there are three options, an arthroscopic procedure, an open soft tissue procedure, or an open bony procedure, the most common of which is the Latage procedure. These will vary with the patient's age, activity levels, and what they've damaged in the shoulder. In terms of imaging, we always start with plain x-rays, but these days it's almost always followed by more advanced imaging. Having said that, a lot can be learned from the plain x-rays, which include an AP shoulder x-ray with the arm in external rotation, a true AP x-ray, which is known as a Grachet view, and one would normally get a scapular lateral and an axillary lateral. Now, a true AP helps detect loss of contour or irregularities of the sclerotic line of the anterior inferior glenoid, and this raises suspicion of a glenoid rim deficiency. 
The lateral Y projection detects translation in the sagittal plane and helps to confirm if the dislocation is anterior or posterior. And the west point or axillary view is a tangential view of the anterior inferior rim of the glenoid. And so in those views, you will see an anterior glenoid rim fracture or some bone loss. Here on these images, we see a small flake of bone and a much larger glenoid fracture. On these images, we see the crush fracture of the humeral head, a relatively small heel sac lesion, and then a much larger heel sac lesion. The heel sac lesion does tend to increase with size with, in size with each subsequent dislocation because the humeral head bone is softer than the glenoid and often gets crushed. Now, a Bankart fracture or glenoid room fracture is actually seen in nearly a third of first-time anterior shoulder dislocations if you look closely enough. A heel sac lesion is seen, is, is seen in up to 90% of patients after their first anterior shoulder dislocation. And with each subsequent dislocation, the size and number of heel sac lesions increases. Now, there are several different methods for calculating the amount of glenoid bone loss, but studies have shown that in the hands of an experienced surgeon, they are all quite accurate. So as, as long as you're measuring it, you'll be okay. It's when you don't measure it that you run into trouble. If you are looking for bone loss, then a CT scan is needed with 3D reconstructions of the humeral head and the glenoid. This allows you to measure and calculate if the lesion is on track or off track, which strongly correlates with the likelihood that the shoulder will re-dislocate if a bone restoration operation is not performed. In these circles, we see a large heel sac lesion at the top of the page and significant glenoid bone loss at the bottom of the page. Now, if the MRI scan is done within a week of the injury, the joint is full of blood and the blood will outline any labral tears. If it's more than that, you need to have, um, you need to order a gadolinium MRI arthrogram so that there's liquid in the joint because otherwise you will miss at least 10% of posterior labral tears and partial thickness rotator cuff tears. And you see in the top images, labral tears, in the bottom left-hand corner over here, a Hagel lesion and over here, the heel sacs lesion. The ISIS score or instability severity index score thankfully has nothing to do with terrorists, but was developed by Pascal, Pascal Boileau in France to try to work out whether to do an arthroscopic repair or a latage. Now in France, they tend to do only one of two operations and for some reason don't seem to do an open capsular shift, which is an incredibly effective operation. Since the score came out, it's been used in multiple studies. Not all of them found it useful in predicting the likelihood of arthroscopic surgery being successful. This means that potentially too many people are having a Latage procedure when a smaller operation with fewer complications, both in the short and long term, could be giving them the same results. As you can see from the score, there are a total of six risk factors with a maximum score of 10 points. Now, there's another score from the US which expanded on the ISIS score, but used 3D CT scans to evaluate the amount of bone loss rather than plain x-rays. The name is much harder to pronounce, and it's called the Glenoid Track Instability Management Score. While this can be a bit difficult to follow initially, in essence, the combined size of the bone loss on the humeral head and glenoid will determine if the ball slips off the socket. On-track lesions are not likely to dislocate, and off-track lesions are. The GTIMS score showed that a lot of patients that would have been placed in a high-risk group for re-dislocation using the ISIS score were actually placed in the wrong group and would have done very well with a soft tissue only procedure. At any given point, the ISIS threshold is a trade-off between risking recurrent instability and performing an excessively high number of latter day procedures, thus significantly increasing the risk of post-operative complications. Remember that neither the ISIS score nor the GTIMS score takes into account Hagel lesions. Now, humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, or Hagel, typically happens with hyperabduction and external rotation of the arm. The incidence is 5 to 10% and is more common in young female athletes. 
It seems to be associated with traction rather than collision and can, can sometimes have pain as well as instability sensations. You can see on this MRI that the capsule is not attached to the neck of the humerus as it should be. The authors of the GTIMS score also perform operations such as an open capsular shift and also add a remplissage to an arthroscopic bank heart repair, which were not included as options with the ISIS score. These give you the same outcomes without resorting to a Latage procedure. There are certainly clear indications to do a Latage, but these are far less than what are called for using that ISIS score. The Latage is a great operation for the right indication, so please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The only issue is that the complication rate for this operation is significantly higher than for an arthroscopic or open capsular shift operation. In the paper by Gupta et al. listed here, a rate of 15 to 30 percent of complications were quoted. The other meta-analysis above it of multiple studies show that the overall complication rate was 6.1 percent, but even in expert hands, the rates were at least triple that of a soft tissue only procedure. It didn't matter whether the operation was done arthroscopically or open as a latage. As well as hardware and graft complications, there was a 1% incidence of a nerve injury, which is very devastating for a young person wanting to return to sport. The other very important thing to remember about this is that these patients are going to get arthritis when they're older. This means that a lot of them are going to need a shoulder replacement. By doing a latage a procedure, we are interfering with their subscapularis muscle, moving their nerves, altering their bony anatomy and leaving screws in place which will get in the way for the next operation. This means that the shoulder replacement will be a bigger and more complicated operation than if they had only had the soft tissue procedure. So what do we tell the person who has had one dislocation who's now sitting in our office? Well, overall we know that the younger they are, the more likely they are to re-dislocate. We know that more dislocations lead to more bone loss and more bone loss requires a bigger operation to fix the problem. Fixing them with an arthroscopic or open soft tissue procedure has a very low complication rate and a very high success rate. So as a surgeon, it's an easy decision to offer the patient surgery. There are essentially three types of operation that can be done for shoulder instability. An arthroscopic bank heart repair is the most common of these. Even with minor bone loss, this is an extremely effective operation. The advantages with an arthroscopic bank heart repair are reduced surgical time, faster recovery, better identification of intra-articular pathology, and an improved cosmetic result. Now, a remplissage can be added to an arthroscopic label repair. Remplissage is a French word which means fill in. The infraspinatus tendon and underlying capsule is transferred into the heel sac defect, converting the defect to an extra-articular defect. Now, this can cause some loss of external rotation, but is very effective at improving stability. Interestingly, the loss of external rotation is less than what you would think. Another adjunct to, adjunct to bank heart repair, which is done far less, is a rotator interval closure. By stitching the subscapularis to the supraspinatus, you reduce anterior translation in abduction and external rotation. This can cause reduced motion in that direction, which is why it's often avoided. It is very useful in patients who are ligamentously lax. The second type of operation is an open bank heart, um, open bank heart operation, which seems to be somewhat of a dying art. And this is something I do a lot of in Fiji and in fact, a lot of in Australia. This was the first operation I learned to deal with shoulder instability before we transitioned over to arthroscopic repairs. And unfortunately, a lot of the younger surgeons coming through these days don't know how to do this operation, so they jump straight from an arthroscopic procedure to a latage when an open capsular shift would have given the patient an excellent result. This is particularly useful when the patient has an acute glenoid fracture or if they have hyperlaxity and you need to significantly tighten the capsule. This is also the best operation to address a haggle lesion. I'm part of a group called Orthopaedic Outreach, and I travel overseas each year to third world countries to teach the local surgeons how to operate. We deal with a lot of chronic shoulder instability in, in these countries, and they don't have um, access to arthroscopic gear. All surgery there is open, whether it's soft tissue or bone transfer. And I've been following up my patients there for 10 years, and the open capsular shift patients are amongst the happiest patients I've ever had.
So it doesn't matter if we do an arthroscopic or open capsular shift without doing bone transfer. In this study comparing open and arthroscopic stabilization, the quality of life scores were the same, but the open group had a lower dislocation rate. This is particularly the case in younger male patients. Most of them do not have bone loss, and yet the response of some surgeons is to do a bone transfer procedure rather than, rather than an open stabilization, which for them is almost certainly the correct operation. An open bank heart procedure can also be considered after failure of an arthroscopic bank heart and has been shown to be successful in patients even of mild to moderate bone loss with an on-track lesion, even in the contact athlete population. Once the patient has significant bone loss and an off-track lesion, then a bone transfer operation is the only solution. This is a wonderful operation for these patients with very high satisfaction rates. There are studies coming out now showing that the reabsorption of the coracoid bone graft will occur if there wasn't any bone loss initially. It seems that the body wants to return the glenoid to its original size, and there are concerns that this may lead to problems with the screws which then might start to migrate. This means that the young contact athlete, athlete is almost certainly better off with an open capsular shift if they don't have significant bone loss. So what is the Lattage procedure or coracoid bone block transfer? In this operation, the coracoid is cut with its muscles still left attached. It's passed through a split in the subscapularis and screwed onto the glenoid. This restores the missing bone from the glenoid. The capsule should then be advanced to create a bumper and tighten the shoulder. Lastly, the conjoint tendon functions as a sling resisting anterior-inferior translation of the humeral head. Now, the majority of patients I see with a first-time dislocation will fit into one of the categories you see on the screen and for that reason will be offered surgery. Generally speaking, the surgery is easier if it's done sooner and there is no advantage to delaying the surgery. Having said that, it's certainly not an emergency and can be booked around work or holiday schedules as long as the person avoids the abducted and externally rotated arm position. Now it is important to have a full workup of the patient with recurrent instability to see which operation will be best for them. You particularly need to know about bone loss and haggle lesions. And this again is where the MRI arthrogram is so important because you can miss a haggle lesion without the arthrogram. As a general rule, patients with hypermobility who can actively dislocate their shoulders themselves are not suitable for surgery. Particularly those that use it as a party trick shouldn't be offered an operation. Remember that instability does not cause pain or impingement in most cases. Now in these patients, I do arrange an MRI to exclude a labral tear. They almost always have a lax capsule and if you do repair them, they tend to stretch the repair out over about a two year period and many of them have pathological soft tissues, with at least 20 of them um, you can expect to fail over that two year period. Now, while surgery is needed occasionally, it's the exception rather than the rule. So when deciding which operation to offer the patient, there are multiple variables to take into account. What's the injury? What procedure should I use? And do I need to combine different techniques? So in the non-contact athlete, without a capsule injury or bone loss, most of the time they'll be offered an arthroscopic stabilization, which always has an element of capsular tightening to it. A Hagel lesion always requires open surgery. What about the patient that has injured their capsule, but not their labrum? Again, for the average person, an arthroscopic capsular advancement will work very well. But in the contact athlete, where a 50% reduction in the capsule volume is needed, compared to the 30% which can be achieved arthroscopically, then an open capsular shift is best. The same basic rules apply when there is minor bone loss and an on-track lesion. In this case, a remplissage will usually be added if there is a decent sized heel sac lesion, but open surgery is needed for the contact athlete. Once the critical threshold of glenoid bone loss is achieved with an off-track lesion, there really is only one option, a Lattage or other bone block operation. What about rehabilitation? 
Well, it's fairly standard, six weeks in a sling, six weeks moving, and then contact sport generally after about six months. It is a bit faster for a Latigé because you're relying more on bone healing than soft tissue healing. And in these patients, I typically get them moving at about four weeks, strengthening at eight weeks, and then I do a, a CT scan at 12 weeks to check if there's solid healing of the bone graft. Once the bone graft has healed, they can then get back to their contact sport. So to try to sum it up on one page, if there's an on-track lesion, an, arth an arthroscopic procedure is like to, likely to work well. Once you get past about 13% of glenoid bone loss, even with an on-track lesion, you probably need to add something to the bank heart repair, a remplissage, a rotator interval closure, or even go straight to an open capsular shift in the younger patients. If there's glenoid bone loss between 13 and 25%, but it's still on track, then an open capsular shift is probably best. And once you have more than about 20% of bone loss or an off-track lesion, then it's best to go straight to a Latigé or other bone block procedure. As with all injuries, take a careful history and make a detailed examination of the patient. Imaging starts with plain x-rays and then will involve an MRI and often a CT scan with 3D reconstructions. Matching the patient's activity level to their imaging, you will find that the great majority of time they will be suitable for an arthroscopic or open stabilization. But of course, there will be a, mon mon there will be a minority of patients where the best operation will be a Latigé, and for them, it is a great operation. I hope you enjoy the rest of our lectures today and look forward to seeing you again in person next year. Thank you.